Well, like we did with Benito Mussolini, we're going to talk a little bit about Francisco Franco's background, because his life and his experience before the 1930s really tells us a lot about his regime. Francisco Franco was born in 1892, and he descended from this long line of naval heroes. So he's got two centuries of family history of the Spanish fleet in his blood. And he wants to join. It's like expected that he's going to join the Navy. Except it's just not meant to be. Because in 1898, as we recall, Spain went to war with the United States. And uh, the United States won that war. And with this devastation of the Spanish Navy, losing Cuba, Puerto Rico, Guam... Uh, most of the empire, the Philippines. This is a humiliating defeat for Spain, and it's humiliating to them, right? This is the height of empire, and it's, it puts Spain into, like, this identity crisis, and it's a political crisis for the government. And as the Spanish empire falls, Franco's home life kind of disintegrates. His father was a naval officer, of course. He was a womanizer. He was a drinker. A uh, man about town, cheated on his wife a lot. Francisco's mother was very Catholic, very strict Catholic. Franco was a mama's boy, as some historians have pointed out. His father basically hated him and really preferred his other brothers. And so Franco kind of has this chip on his shoulder. He wants to prove to his father that he can be a man, it can be that guy. He goes on to a career in the military, and of course he wanted to join the Navy, but... Spain closed their naval academy after the loss of the empire, after the Spanish-American War. So in 1907, Francisco Franco went to the Toledo Military Academy. He was determined to be an officer. Now he's this small guy, high-pitched voice, and ended up being bullied a lot uh, because of this. And so this is going to kind of just strengthen that resolve to be something big. When he graduated from the military academy, he basically volunteered to go to one of the last remaining Spanish colonial outposts, Morocco. Now the idea here is that if he goes to this outpost, he can advance through the ranks more quickly. It's a great place to get a promotion. And in 1912, there was a campaign in Morocco to get rid of the Spanish, to overthrow the Spanish rule. Franco is there and starts to command this thing called the Army of Africa. The Army of Africa was a Spanish army that was comprised of people in Morocco, Moroccans, who were fighting for Spanish control. So Franco is assigned to the Army of Africa, and this is where he's going to start training in tactics that he is going to use in his campaign to become a dictator. The Army of Africa is basically known for their terror tactics. Just indiscriminate, arbitrary use of force to instill fear in people. And a lot of the violence was meant to be public, it was meant to be seen. And his experience in Morocco, in this colonial war, a war without limits, with torture, with mass killings, really shaped his character. His unit, the Army of Africa, basically became famous, or really more infamous, for their bloodthirsty tactics. They would cut off ears, noses, heads as trophies. Now, while he's in Morocco, he's leading a, a campaign, he gets shot, and it was an abdominal wound. Now, in those times, abdominal wounds are basically death sentences. But against all odds, he made a full recovery and was promoted to major. Now, to this deeply Catholic man, this is a sign that God had intervened. He had a purpose in life. God had chosen him to help Spain. In fact, he won at one point recalled, without Africa, I do not know how to define myself. After World War I, in 1926, at the age of 34, he was promoted to Brigadier General, which meant he was the youngest general in all of Europe. He was at the peak of his career. But in that time, there's a lot of political change going on in Europe and an even more political change going on in Spain. Of course, the First World War had a lot to do with that, as well as the Russian Revolution. They've transformed European society. But the country was in the midst of industrialization. With this industrialization and lots of social inequality, 
The political system, which was a monarchy, was proving to be very problematic, and many people started to turn to ideas like socialism, inspired partially by Russia's example, right? Leninist Russia. Others look to fascism as an example, Mussolini's example. Now, people who are impoverished are looking at the Spanish churches, which have these gold altars. Meanwhile, people are starving, and they see this inequality, and they want to do something about it. Then there's anarchists who just want to tear down the whole power structure. Franco is a traditionalist. He relates to the military, he relates to the monarchy. Anything other than that is just too much. In 1931, support for the monarchy is plummeting, and the Spanish king, Alfonso XIII, agreed to step down. And within months, a new republic was set up. Now, see if this sounds familiar. Governments topple, a king steps aside, and a new republic is formed. Now, this new republic was left-leaning in nature. They pushed through a new constitution that guaranteed a free press, regular elections, and in these elections, every adult could vote. Men, women alike could vote. The left-leaning government, they were called the Popular Front. Franco had an idea of this authentic Spain. It was Catholic, it protected private property. And as Franco saw it, these things were being challenged by the left, by the Popular Front. Well, two years later, 1933, there's an election. Spain swings to the right. Conservative parties won that election. Now, Francisco Franco, the hero of Africa, was promoted to major general uh, that same, at the same time. A year later, 1934, there's a massive strike by laborers in a coal-rich region of northwestern Spain. Francisco Franco was called upon to restore order. Franco sees this as a huge opportunity. He is offended by communists and socialists. He ordered groups from the Army of Africa to go to this part of Spain to put down the strikes. So this is the same group of guys who were cutting off heads in Morocco. They're now going to, to northwest Spain. His troops rounded up 3,000 Spaniards and gunned them down in broad daylight. Uh, he ordered the Navy to bombard the coast, and he ordered the Air Force to bombard mining villages from the air. 30,000 prisoners were transferred to prisons outside of Spain to serve sentences. So there's beginnings of mass repression, the same tactics used in the colonial war now being applied to the mainland. This is not a war against Moroccans, this is a war against Spaniards. In 1936, there's another election, and this time the pendulum swung back to the Popular Front, ejecting the right wing, the conservative wing. This parliamentary majority meant disaster for Franco. The Popular Front banished Francisco Franco to the Canary Islands, 100 kilometers off the coast of Africa, 2,000 kilometers from Madrid. They want to get him as far away as possible. Franco and other generals learn that left-wing extremists have been executing priests and burning churches. And these generals start to plan a coup d'etat, and they asked Franco to take a leading role. Now, Franco is pretty cautious about joining because if he fails, that means he'll be executed as a traitor. He's got a wife, he's got a kid, he's got a career to worry about. But circumstances kind of forced his hand. In July of 1936, a leading right-wing politician was assassinated while in police custody in Madrid. And this is kind of the trigger. This is the final straw. For Franco and the generals. Uh, just a few days later, Francisco Franco put on civilian clothes and secretly boarded a plane to mainland Africa. The coup was on. To get his troops from Morocco into Spain was quite a challenge. How do you get across the Strait of Gibraltar when it's being guarded by that Spanish navy? So Franco decides he needs planes. So how do you get planes if you don't have them? He decided to ask Mussolini and Hitler for help. And Mussolini and Hitler leapt at the chance to use Spain as a testing ground for new weapons and tactics. Without the help of those fascist powers, the Army of Africa would have had a very tough time succeeding in this coup. And once on mainland Spain, Franco began a merciless march north to Madrid. 
as they're encountering towns, they're not encountering armies, they're just encountering civilians, who are basically peasants armed with farm implements. And anytime Franco's men met opposition, they massacre the civilians. It was absolute carnage. The church, by the way, supported the coup d'etat. This civil war was a battle for the soul of the nation. Franco believed he should do anything at his disposal to get rid of the left. Any officers who refused to support the coup were executed. He even executed his own cousin. The cruelty was the point. The scale of violence was pretty unique in the Spanish Civil War. Franco basically perceived half of all Spaniards as not properly Spanish. Remember, dividing us versus them. City by city, town by town, Franco's men arrested anyone with Republican sympathies. Republican meaning the popular front. Not Don't think of this as American Republican Party. As the war progressed, Franco intensified his attacks on civilians by obliterating towns and villages. Probably the biggest symbol of this is Guernica. Guernica was a city in the Basque region of Spain, and Franco basically ordered it completely obliterated. It was one of the worst civilian casualties of the Spanish Civil War. This devastating assault on Guernica inspired Pablo Picasso to paint the anti-war painting Guernica. Uh, Pablo Picasso painted this for the 1937 World's Fair, and uh, I've put a link to a video that kind of talks about this painting, kind of interprets it. Very, very fascinating. In 1939, as Spain was tearing itself apart, Europe braced for war. As Hitler became the biggest threat to Europe, the Soviet Union withdrew their support from the Republic, from the Popular Front, and the Popular Front collapsed. On March 27, 1939, Franco's forces paraded through Madrid and took it, celebrating their victory. And just because the war was over didn't mean that Franco's war on civilians was over. His goal was to completely exterminate opposition to his regime so he could rule for the next 40 years. What was the effect of Franco's rule? According to Amnesty International, Spain has the second largest number of mass graves in the world after Cambodia. And there is currently an effort underway to try to identify who's buried in those graves and provide closure to the families who lost family members because of their political stance. And just as an aside, it was only last year that the Spanish government decided to move his body so that it wouldn't be a pilgrimage site for people who are far right leaning in Spain today. I said this one was going to be a little bit shorter. I'm sorry. It's just the more you get into it, the more fascinating it is. But we'll take it easy come World War II. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's World War II. You can't. But stay tuned for the next lecture.